Cordero, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is okay, the sound? Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jacopo. Thank you, everybody, for the invitation. It has been very stimulating this uh, couple of days. Unfortunately, tomorrow I, I have to go back to Vienna where I'm doing my sabbatical. Um, and um, I'm Otto Cordero from MIT. I'm from Ecuador. So uh, I'm going to talk about something that I, I think uh, last uh, night's conversation made me realize is in, in many people's minds, which I find satisfying because it's also in mine. And I think it's a really good problem to work on. Uh, so, so I'm going to talk about it from different perspectives. So um, uh, did, I'm borrowing here some uh, uh, language from uh, my, my friend Seppe Quinn from the University of Chicago, the, asking the question, what is the right language to describe microbial communities? This is uh, obviously a, a kind of a poetic way to ask the question of uh, what, are, what are the right variables, because we are, we are uh, imposed or we have been imposed the, the variables from uh, sequencing technologies, where you get ASVs, OTUs, uh, whatever, whatever thing is that some, some genetic units, right? And then I think uh, I don't need to convince you uh, that uh, this may not be the right variables, although we're going to look into it in a second. So it turns out ecologists, uh, uh, the traditional ecologists, uh, let's, let's say, uh, have thought about this for, for a while. And, and so they, they have what is called trait-based ecology, and here's a, just one example, just to give an idea of what, that, what this could mean. Uh, somebody mentioned yesterday uh, that uh, when thinking about ants and plants and whatever, uh, pe people were used to thinking about roles. And so uh, here in this picture, uh, roles could be pollinators, uh, you know, the, the, the herbivores, the insects that are eating the plants, the, the, the organisms in the soil that are recycling or fixing nitrogen, et cetera, et cetera. To some extent, this is a human construct one can imagine, right? But, uh, but in, in many other cases, uh, at least in the case of plants, I think this is, this is rooted in physiology and people understand the constraints and so on. So they can explain quite a bit from these traits. But the general problem stands in any kind of ecology is what is a trait beyond the things that make sense to our limited understanding of biology. Right? And so in microbial ecology, this is, this is apparently more pro problematic. And, uh, but people have, uh, this is what, I'm, what I was saying, people have tried to address this problem, uh, develop databases of traits, for example. It's a noble effort, uh, in my opinion, uh, but they, they, they have inherent problems. And here's, a, here's an, an example, the maximal growth rate, whether this organism is dormant or not, uh, cold tolerance, motility, and stuff like that. So, I don't know what you guys think. I find this dissatisfying again because uh, it's that these are whatever we think. It's a, it's, um, it's a supervised learning. Yeah? It's whatever we categories that are in our minds that we think are relevant, that we know, maybe we, what we have read. But then uh, uh, this is not necessarily what matters. There is no objective way here to define what really matters. And, and, and also more complicated is how you de determine what matters means. Uh, so, so this is out there, but uh, uh, the question in my mind is uh, how to do this better, because this is uh, based on manual curation, uh, functional annotations, and so on that are problematic. Uh, is there uh, a way to discover these ecological gills? I'm also going to use this, this terminology of ecological gills. Uh, uh, is there any way to, this, to uh, discover these gills in a, in a data-driven way so, or in an unsupervised way? Okay, that's a, that's a challenge I'm gonna try to address. Uh, yes. Oh, okay, so guild uh, simply, the, the roles in the previous case, uh, the, the, the illustration. Right, so, so uh, organisms that have, that share a set of traits. And so the, the roles in the case of, uh, I mean, a very compelling example would be, you have primary producers, you have herbivores, you have uh, the, the carnivores and stuff like that. These are roles in an ecosystem, right? Uh, These are roles within the community. And the, and the properties of the community may emerge from interactions between these guilds, these functional, functional groups, yeah? So, so the, just to give you a, 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 a warning, I don't know, <laughs> the, is that the right word? This problem is not solved in general. So I'm gonna, just gonna tell you that I think it's solvable and, and we're making a little bit of progress in this direction. And I'm also gonna tell you the limitations. But uh, uh, to start, I want to, I, want you, I want to introduce you to these beautiful little things. 
that are called the, Sipe, the, the Pink Berries of Sipewisset Marsh. Sipewisset Marsh is in, uh, in, uh, near Boston, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and these little things, they are about a millimeter approximately in, in diameter. Uh, these are microbial consortia that self-organize in these little granules. There are other cases in industry and in the environment with microbial consortia organized in, in spatially structured aggregates, like spheroids. Uh, and this is one of the most charismatic ones. Um, and so uh, uh, before I go on, I, I'll tell you that this, this work uh, has been, it has been, it's one of these projects that has been going on at a very slow rate in the lab for many years. Uh, but we are, I think uh, we're probably gonna submit it uh, this year. And this has been led by uh, Achit Goyal, you saw his face previously, <laughs> and uh, Gary Leventhal, who's now uh, in, back in Switzerland in industry. Um, but it's a col collaboration with people at uh, Santa Barbara, uh, Lizzie Wilbanks and uh, Boris Schreiman. So what are these pink berries? From a metabolic standpoint, they, uh, Lizzie Wilbanks uh, published a paper a year, some years ago uh, showing more or less the, uh, a scheme where, of, of what, what they do. So you have, uh, in principle, this is an engine that cycles uh, different um, chemical species of sulfur, sulfur in different redox states. So the pink things are purple, purple sulfur bacteria that uh, they're oxytrophs, they uh, oxidize uh, sulfide. So they are uh, also photosynthetic, so instead of using water like uh, green algae, they use hydrogen sulfide. And then uh, that produces sulfate, it can also produce sulfur granules. Uh, I skipped that picture from the slides, but it's a beautiful picture, just in the interest of time, but you can see little sulfur granules on the, on the surface of the berries. And, um, and the sulfate goes to the sulfate reducer, which is a heterotroph that takes carbon, uh, organic carbon, and uses sulfate as an electron acceptor, producing again sulfide that goes back, so the cycle goes on. I am, this is not so important, but I'm not sure this is necessarily a cycle because there's sulfate, uh, abundant amount of sulfate in, in where these uh, creatures, these meta creatures are, are found, but that's not very important. So there are two main functional roles here, that's what I want to say, sulfide re oxidizer, sulfate reducer. The, the, where you find them is a beautiful marsh, as told you, Sipe Wizard Marsh in the coast of Massachusetts. You can walk in this little, in this uh, beautiful place when the tides are low, it's a tidal place. Sometimes it's completely flooded, and sometimes the tides are, are, are low, and then you can look in these little tidal ponds, and you may see already from where you're sitting these little pink dots. These are the pink berries, so you can pick them and say this is one community, and you pick another one and say this is another ecological replicate of a community. And that's what attracted me to this uh, years ago when we started uh, this, uh, looking into this, uh, these systems. And, um, and so what we did is, I mean, from a methodological standpoint, it's embarrassingly simple, and I sort of regret not, not doing more now that I, I know more about it. Uh, so we just, we just sequenced the genomes of these, of these things. But when I said regret not doing more, I regret not measuring, not measuring fluxes, for example, uh, because we could have done much more with that. But I, I didn't know that at the time uh, in my defense. But um, so because what I, what I was interested at the moment was coevolution, you know, because it's a beautiful case where you have this genome, uh, genotype, I should say, of one organism that is metabolically coupled with the other one, and you have the genotype, and you have potentially hundreds and hundreds of these replicates, so you can see if there's any pattern of co-diversification. And so, uh, and, and the other thing that we can do is the structure function type of questions. So about the first one, I can tell you a story, I'm not gonna do that in the interest of time. The, the simple answer is, there's an interesting an analysis that actually did, but there is no evidence of co-diversification. As far as we can tell, these little things assemble and disassemble frequently. So it's not like they are replicating as a unit, in which case you would have a co-inheritance of mutations. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about is the structure function uh, question. So we have 192 individual berries that we sequence with metagen and we, with full metagenomics. So we, and from that we assemble 58, uh, these are called max, metagenomically assembled genomes, approximately the gene, the consensus genome of the different species in the system. So there are at least 58 there, not just these two things, right? Okay, so uh, the structure function question. So this is a phylogeny of those 58 things. So it turns out this is one of these cases, like I know, f so if you're not a microbiologist or environmental microbiologist, these names don't tell you anything. I have been long enough in the field 
that I can look at these names <coughs> and, I, and something pops in my mind that, that with a certain function. And sometimes you don't need to know much uh, to do that. Uh, um, so I can tell you, and you know, we can also, of course, look at the genomes, and we know where are the genes involved in, this, in these pathways. So what you have here uh, that I'm highlighting are the, the sulfide oxidizers. It's a <coughs> specific clade of uh, gamma predator bacteria, well known to be what's called purple sulfur bacteria, as well as some alpha predator bacteria that also have the genetic potential to do that. Then there is a, the sulfobacteria, which not surprisingly, as the name indicates, is a sulfate reducer, also very specialized type of organisms. And there are a few of those, and there's a specific clay there. Right? And then uh, another thing that cop, uh, pops, pops out, I think, is this relatively large clay of bacteroidids, similar to some extent to those that are in our guts. They love to degrade po complex polysaccharides, and these polysaccharides in the this, in this salt marshes are very complex and sulfated. So at least, I don't know, that's a, there are some things down the line there that are also predators, bac bacterial predators. You know? Maybe they're eating other bacteria, but whatever. Now we have 182 replicates, so now you can look at the variation uh, across this, uh, this system. So this picture is, question. yes. So what is the structure? <clears throat> is it a biofilm? Is it, how do they build the structure? Uh, it's like a biofilm, yes, but it's, uh, it's relatively densely packed with cells. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they're about a, a millimeter, uh, all of them, yeah. Um, 20% variation around that, I would say, yeah. Yeah, but they, I mean, over seasons, they change in, in time. In our sampling, they are comparable. When it's cold, they are small. <clears throat> yeah. The maximum size could be a couple of millimeters, but those are rare to find. Probably somebody eats them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <coughs> you can keep them um, alive but uh, you don't see biomass increase. And uh, yeah, you can also kill them very easily. If you put them in the wrong medium, you see accumulation of ammonium and starts to stink and they become dark. But you can keep them alive. And Lizzie Wilbans is the expert in that. Therefore, synthetic, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they're in shallow, shallow uh, tidal ponds. Mm -hmm. Probably not, but, but from pictures I have seen, and there's only one picture of this, there was no obvious uh, gradient structure. The, this, I don't know, maybe it's, you need to do more. There, there should be something, I think, but. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let, me, let me explain this complicated figure. So I just took, you know, this was, was, was previously on the slide. I just took this one, <clears throat> rotated 90 degrees, and chopped the bottom so I can show you the, the upper part. <coughs> and then, okay, so that's the phylogeny on the left. Now this confetti thing in the middle, um, each of these little bubbles is the fractional abundance of this particular genotype in a, in a given berry. Uh, the dark dot is the mean of that fractional abundance. Uh, and the colors correspond to different geographic locations, different ponds, but you can ignore that for the purpose of this talk. And then I'm, uh, the, here I'm highlighting the two most abundant things, which are indeed a sulfide oxidizer and a sulfate reducer. <clears throat> and the main thing I want to, to say with this, uh, there is a huge variation in, in, ab in fractional abundance. That's my main point. There are approximately four orders of magnitude in, in many cases when you look at the, at the, at the fractional abundance of the, each individual uh, taxon. Um, Okay, so this is not super new, right? So there's a lot of compositional variability when you look at this level of resolution. Now, um, if you group them according to what we think are functional roles, and then you, you look, yeah. <coughs> if you group together all the genes of the 58 genomes that you assembled, and then you look at all the other genes which, that you found but you couldn't assemble, which fraction of the fun yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, I don't remember that number. I don't remember that number. I'm sorry. Uh, my, my guess is that it's, it's pretty high because we get the most abundant organisms. Right? But, um, so if you group these taxa in what we think are the functional groups, oxidizers, reducers, and, and others, 
Then you get something that uh, is obviously, obviously I should emphasize is much more stable in the statistical sense. That the variation is not four orders of magnitude from, from minus whatever, you know, 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus one or something like that. It's all fluctuating, you know, not too much. Around 20% for the reducers, around 50% for the oxidizers and so on. So on. I, I emphasize this, this, this is extremely obvious to anybody that knows elementary statistics because you're just grouping things, right? But everything that you find, there, is a, there, is a, there are a lot of highly cited papers in the literature saying that uh, func functions are more stable than taxonomy and it's just statistics. It's just statistics. If, because if you take anything random and of the same size and you group it, you'll find exactly the same thing. Show you did this uh, and it's just, there is, no, there is nothing, there is no signal, right? So it's just statistics. <clears throat> so the question, is this just statistics? is the question. So this is where Akshit um, intervened. And then so he took this phylogeny and said broke it in little pieces, basically all possible subclades, and asked and created all possible groups, say of size two, all possible groups of size three, and so on, and asked what is the, <coughs> the variability of, the, of these groups uh, in the statistical sense again. So, so this is what I'm describing here. That's the metric used, just coefficient of variation and the sum of the coefficients of variation for a given number of groups. And it turns out that the, the SOB, so sulfate oxidizer, sulfide reducer by partition is the most stable statistical one. <clears throat> Which is to say that if we were to, if we don't know any biology and we just take this thing and ask the computer to give us the most statistically stable grouping, we recover the, the biologically meaningful uh, set. And I don't think that's, that's totally trivial, right? So, so this, this gives me hope that uh, actually one can approach this problem in a systematic way. Uh, but this, this is a very simple example. Maybe once we go to more, more functions, and more, then it becomes more complicated. I don't ha that's where we are at the moment. We don't have a great solution for this yet. Uh, <clears throat> So, oh, sorry, uh, and if we, if we do the, the, the D, so the number of groups equals three, then you find the, the bacteroidids, the, the polysaccharide degraders. Um, and so, so there is one extension of this idea because here we don't, ha we don't have a readout of function. This is what I said at the beginning. I regret not measuring more about the fluxes or anything. It's just the stability of composition is what we're looking at. But uh, um, there's other types of data sets where, where one could say, I, I have a measurement of a function, which let's say this is typically in the context of human health, where you have you know, all these uh, examples of microbiomes from patients and some, some phenotype, maybe disease, no disease, right? And then the game that people want to play uh, is, can I find a predictor of the disease? And then you know, obviously, all, all the things that would follow. <clears throat> so this is, this is called association studies, like the typical, the GWAS for, you know, in the case of genetics microbiome association studies when you find an, a microorganism that is correlated with a disease or with health. But uh, if you think about this functional redundancy now, you immediately see a problem because there may be nothing, no individual microorganism that correlates because you're not looking at the right unit. If this, if this disease or whatever function it is, is attributed not to a single species but to a group of species, then the statistics break down. So I, I mean, I think this is an important problem, but I don't, I'm not so interested in the, in the application of this, but I, I use it only to introduce the, the way we, we approach it uh, as well. So with, with Xiao Yu Shan, uh, a student in my lab who just graduated, uh, uh, we looked into this and <clears throat> he, I, I actually thought it initially wasn't possible, but he, he found a solution that now in retrospect, is, uh, it, it makes it very clear that it's, it should be possible to do this in this particular case. Um, when you have some composition of microbes, this is a cartoon, right? So these are the, the many colors there uh, where you, the, the different bars are samples and the colors are different species. And the little dark triangles are, say, a, a function that you measure. Let's say it's CO2, whatever, whatever it is. But this is important. I will come, it will come later. And, um, and then you want to find the grouping that best explains that function in the, in the statistical sense. And it turns out in this example, of course, is the, the blue and the red you group together, then you get it. And so in, uh, what, uh, what, what becomes obvious when you do this is that this group, what, what kind of things you should group, uh, what statistical properties they should have is that 
the blue and the red should be somewhat positively correlated with the effect that you want to have. And ideally, they should be as anti-correlated as possible with each other, which is exactly the same idea in, in the stock market. When you have a, want to have a portfolio of stocks, you don't want your stocks to be correlated because then you are, you know, you are increasing the risk of fluctuations. In order for the portfolio to be stable, you want to spread the risk by having anti-correlated things. Exactly the same idea. And so and we, that's, that's kind of the, the, what the algorithm does. This is just explaining the same thing in a, a bit more, with more formal terms. What you want to maximize is the projection of your group of species on the, because these are vectors, because you have many different samples, on the vector of the functions that you measure at, to the extent that this, that this angle is zero, then your correlation is excellent. Uh, and the, the, the orthogonal uh, axis is the errors, the residuals of the regression, right? And that you want to cancel out, and you only cancel them out when, you, when the, the vectors are, are pointing in different directions, like the blue and the red. It's, it's just what I said. And so Shayu came up with an algorithm to do this, which uh, we, we define, and I'm not getting, getting you any details about this, uh, but I can talk more about it. It's just an ob objective function that is an expression of the R square, and a search process that, that goes through the possible combinations of species, and some penalty for group size. We have to regularize. Uh, and so, and then turns out that the examples that we've, um, we, we have three examples in the paper, and the, in all these cases, the answers are very satisfying in terms of our, our understanding and expectations of the system. And I'm just gonna show you one, which I think is, uh, uh, serves the purpose. Uh, so we took the, the, the Tara Oceans data, and uh, the Tara Oceans data is just many, so I think 128 stations in the ocean where they were sampled at different depths. And then in the, in the ocean, you have a gradients of, of many things, for especially, for example, nitrate, the nitrogen, dominant nitrogen species in the ocean uh, has a profile with depth. And not only with depth, also with different, uh, but mainly depth. And, um, and so but nitrate, that we know is, a, is controlled by microbial activity. That one we know is important. I mean, it's a result of ammonia oxidation, denitrification, and these things. So can we find out of the many species in the ocean, which ones are more, uh, uh, you know, when grouped together, allow you to explain statistically the, the concentrations of nitrate. And, and this is the group of species. The size of the bubbles indicates how important they are for the statistical regression. And the edges between the bubbles is how important having both together uh, is for the statistical re regression. That doesn't matter so much for what, what I want to say. The two most important ones are these two things, nitro so puluminiciae and uh, candidata scandilua. And uh, if you look at what these things do, um, the one is an, uh, ammon they are both ammonia oxidizers. So they convert nit uh, ammonium to nitrite. And uh, it turns out one is aerobic and the other one is anaerobic. And so this is exactly the, the, what I was telling you about. They, they perform the same function in terms of ammonia oxidation, but in different environments. You know, when you consider the other variables like oxygen concentration, they will be anti-correlated as they are in this figure. So that's, that's in the, this is how the thing works, the game works. You know, so there are a lot of different microenvironments that we are not taking into account. That, the term, that explain the diversity of species that perform the same function. And you can statistically uh, sort of integrate over that and recover the, the, the function that you care about if you have the functional readouts, which in this case is nitrate. Okay, so um, anyway, there, there are other examples. Uh, this one is a little, it's maybe relevant, but this is if only for those of, so if you haven't seen this paper from, from uh, Alberto Sanchez lab on the emerging simplicity, forget about this slide. If you have seen it, then you know, you know the, the functional groups are taxonomic units, families, Enterobacteriaceae and Pseudomonas, and you can recover that using this algorithm and you get exactly the same thing. So you don't need to know the phylogeny to, to know this. Uh, anyway, the, to me this, this uh, uh, yes. Are there cases where the functional groups are in the Phylogeny. The ammonia oxidizers will be one of these cases. Drast, completely different. Share genes by horizontal transfer. Uh, I'm not sure what is the history of the ammonia uh, oxidation enzyme, but uh, yeah, this is not monophyletic. Most are archaea, but these guys are are distant. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, but, but in general, I think there is a phylo strong phylogenetic signal, I, I would say. That's my expectation. Yeah. So, so I'm just saying here, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, this is an aspirational slide. So, so what we have now is the mi microscopic variables that we get from sequencing from the omics. We would like to get to having these mesoscopic variables that we postulate would be much better at explaining the environmental parameters, the functions, the fluxes, and things like that. And we, I think this is, technically speaking, a, a, a solvable problem. And the limitation, I don't think, is computation, and I don't think it's math. The limitation is the lack of suitable data sets, because there is a whole, I mean, there is a, you, can, uh, you, you cannot uh, count the number of data sets that are uh, uh, quantifying what's on the left of this picture, structure. Thousands and thousands and thousands of data sets from the ocean, from the gut, et cetera, et cetera, from soils, telling you what species are there and in what abundance and, and what genes and so on. But it's, there is almost nothing on the, on the functional side. And I think this is partly a cultural problem, partly a technical problem. It's much more difficult to do than sequencing, et cetera, et cetera. But I think this is what's holding us back. Okay, and this is kind of where, where we like to work on. And so if, if I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to have discussions with people about this because if we have good ideas, we can, we can really put a lot of resources into something that addresses this challenge. Yeah. You're going to shift to the next topic but before you do. Let me just catch you on this. So for this very nice uh, classification you are doing, can you... Zooming to the next level to see you know, where where do you stop? You know, you're you you're, 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 even when you do this of shuffling and so forth, right? You 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 deciding some kind of a coarse grain level, and, and then it, it is a classification that's that, that reproduces your sulfur reducer and oxidizer. Ah, uh, okay. Right? So in, in principle, you can push this further. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a good question for for the first case for the sulfur reducer oxidizer. Yes, yes. That's a good question. No, 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 right. That's a great, so I interpret the question as, how do you know the, it's like the, a clustering problem. How do you know the ideal number of clusters? Right. Well, what's the, what's the yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, we haven't looked into this, but this is something we can, we can tackle. But it shouldn't be, it should be, you know, what people have thought about in terms of clustering. There has to be some statistical metric. Right. For sure, at some point there should be disagreement, and then, but like, uh, at some point it has to be worse than the previous level by some metric. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, um, I, I would like you to great. This, uh, if it works, it's great, and I understand the limitations because of the not measuring a lot of functions. I'm just wondering. How sensitive is this technique if you're trying to combine data from different sources? So when you work with Star Ocean, that was kind of single source. But when you are combining data from different, different groups measured the same function, but they measured slightly different techniques, and all those negative correlations which are essential for you to uh, bet hedge against uh, risk, so to say, might be a batch artifact. So yeah, that's yeah, okay, so this, to me, if I understand, gets into the problem yeah, okay. It's not just measure functions. Now we need to understand a bit more about in what state is these communities. For example, this, if this community is going over successions, then things are going to be positively correlated because there's a systemic change. Right? So ideally, these things should have <coughs> equilibrated in some way after community assembly, and you have variation that comes from the microscopic processes. Let's say the noise, as somebody said yesterday, phages, uh, resource ordering, you know, the, the hierarchy of resource preference, whatever it is. And, uh, and then, then they'll say, this is the ideal data set. But that, that can be constrained when you, so okay, it's not just taking samples, I should say. Okay, that's a good point, yeah. All right, so yeah, the, you, you answered another question which I wanted to ask, but right now I was asking about much more mundane things, that if you have one big project like Tara Ocean, which measured everything in one kind of standard, 
then those negative correlations are relatively free of artifacts. But if you have several, seven groups which measured it using yeah. their different standards, yeah. when you combine the data and try to find this correlation analysis, you will have the yeah. batch effect which will spoil the, yeah, the, the exactly. power. Yeah, that's true also. Yeah, it should be standardized, yeah. I think Martina had a... Um, actually, I was thinking that over successions, uh, it's actually when you have problems because I thought that over succession you have a lot of anticorrelating, uh, anticorrelated abundances because you have species increasing in abundances and species decreasing in abundances yeah. because. But so at different time points. So in one snapshot, yeah, no, uh, you know, they're all, they're all. So for example, if I take many replicates of the succession, at initial time points, everything that is an early succession of species will be correlated. And the anti-correlated with the late succession of species. Okay, no, I, right. I, okay, I get it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, can, I, can I ask a question? Yes, so please. the existence and the possibility to find these guilds, it seems to me that strongly depends, I mean, in, uh, let's say a data set like you should, it strongly depends on how the environment is varying across, uh, across samples, right? Yeah. In the sense that uh, what are the axes of the variation of the environments determine what are the functional groups you can find? It's not something... Yes. Uh, because, like, I mean, also this anti-correlation, right? Let's say if the environment is fixed between quotes, like what you can do in experiments, you expect this anti-correlation. But if you're in a natural environment, the anti-correlation between a species within the same group, but if you're in a natural environment where this environmental axis is varying, yeah then this correlation becomes positive, yeah. right? So, yeah. so, so, I mean, I think, let, let's even imagine a case where the experiment is done in the lab under control conditions. So let's imagine it's a complex community, but, but I, have, I have control conditions. I'm still also not totally sure about this in, in the sense of, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Yes, so depending on if you, how you vary that environment, imagine that you can, I can manipulate, I can put a little bit of more of nitrogen, a little bit more, less oxygen, a little bit of this, whatever, change, put some noise on the dilutions or something like that. All of these will give me some answers, right? But um, are there, uh, is there a way to do this that is uh, unbiased? I, I'm not totally sure of this yet. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just stop it going. <coughs> The data you show, I don't think it's even fluctuation. You know, the nitrogen uh, yeah. thing, right? Yeah. I mean, you basically, I look at your data, there's just two clusters. One is when, when the, yes. the, what's the x-axis? Oxygen, oxygen, oxygen yeah. And oxygen poison. Exactly. Okay. So it's not bad hedging or anything. It's just like, you know, in, in one right. one regime is doing one thing, the right. other regime is doing So, so if you, in that case, right, if you would no, pertur perturb the oxygen concentration, then you learn this. But No, no, but... In that case, that is constant, but then you have, fluctu I mean, there is something that is determining the fluctuations within, yes. which is what is varying, right? Okay. But suppose that these other things that is varying is now constant, and what you vary is whatever determines the fixed level, you should see, I mean, you should see a completely different pictures. Yeah. Right? It's so related to what is varying yeah. and what is constant in the environment. His data set is lumping everything. No, yes, yes. So I can, we, can, we can talk more about this. I, I actually really want to talk about it. I, uh, I can tell you where we are now is, um, I think, right now, but this thinking is evolving uh, on a daily basis. We're going to just perturb a set of variables that I think makes sense, but knowing that this is still biased because it's whatever we're imposing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but um, yeah, this is a, it's a hard problem. So I have, like, maybe 20 minutes, I think, left, and uh, if I'm not mistaken. So I, I have um, a different, I want to tell you about a different approach for this problem which is not, uh, well, I guess it's partly a way to solve the problem, but maybe from the bottom up. And, uh, and, and with that, I also want to tell you about a little bit of, uh, tell you about the things that we, we have been doing over the years in a very simple, simple manner. So, so we, we have been studying community assembly in marine ecosystems, coastal environments. And uh, <clears throat> what, uh, what, what, the, 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 the way we conceptualize the ocean, let's say, is as a huge biodigester that uh, we have primary production on the surface, enormous amount of carbon and nitrogen and, and complex organic matter that starts to, to sink in the ocean. And then in the ocean, bacteria are the main uh, recyclers of, or, or of these forms of organic carbon. In soils, it's, 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 uh, fungi are more, more relevant, uh, but in, in the ocean, it, we think it's mainly bacteria. 
Um, and, and then the way this happens, so there's a lot of dissolved organic matter that where you have oligotrophs that are consuming that, that have very high affinities for the substrates, but you also have these little uh, patches of nutrients that people call marine snow, where bacteria sort of congregate. This could be fecal pellets from, from zooplankton, or it could be dying algae. It's a bunch of different things. And then, uh, but these are hotspots of biological activity, and this is where the copiotrophs, I, I, I like, thank you for introducing this, this uh, terminology uh, earlier on. Uh, the copiotrophs that love uh, high concentrations of nutrients and have this boom and bust uh, dynamics, that's where they colonize and where they grow. So that's where community assembly happens on, on well-defined uh, spatial scales. <clears throat> uh, okay, that's what I said. So, um, so here we can ask the question of how is metabolic labor divided? What are the roles of the community, in other words? Uh, um, so so the, we, I'm not gonna talk too much about this. This is a bit of old news, but the way you know, we started doing these uh, experiments was using a synthetic particle that was, in this case, a little bead. It's a hydrogel with chitin and has a magnetic core. We put it in seawater, and it turns out it's like you can, you can uh, farm little communities and, and pull them out of seawater, and you see these beautiful patterns of colonization on the surfaces. Uh, and then, uh, so these are, for example, natural seawater bacteria colonizing and like forming little colonies and, and, and doing crazy things. Now we have, we are developing techniques to look at this colonization process in real time using microfluidics. Uh, so it's something I, I, I we, we have to talk. Uh, and uh, anyway, so, but then the, for the purpose of this talk, what I want to tell you is that we developed an isolate collection from, from this, uh, from this um, system. So a collection of marine bacteria that colonize these particles, right? <clears throat> So the way this works, the pipeline has been, you, you take this particle, you immerse it in, in, uh, in seawater, then uh, you get the colonization, you can sample your particles at different times, so you can see the dynamics of the assembly. Uh, and then we can culture this bacteria. It turns out that many of the particles, that, sorry, of the bacteria that we collect on particles are, are culturable, uh, for reasons I can explain. So then we developed uh, a culture collection from that, and then uh, we have a few hundred uh, isolates are genotype, and about 200 for we have, which have good quality full genome sequences. And then uh, the, we, we did the phenotyping, that's what I want to tell you about. And then we can try to understand now how to put them together in a, thing, in a way that makes sense. And so this phenotyping is, is the, 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 what's the left in, in my talk. And this was the work of Mati Gralka, uh, who is incidentally a physicist. Uh, who is now uh, leading a group on quantitative ecology or quantitative microbiology, I'm not sure, I, I forgot how he calls it, in, uh, in uh, the University of Amsterdam. So about a, uh, so 186 uh, strains are grown on 135 different carbon sources. And, uh, and you see here the, the different taxa. Of course, this doesn't need to mean anything to you, but these are the most abundant groups of copiotrophs in the marine environment. So this is what the data looks like when he does his growth experiments for, uh, for this is one organism, uh, the, the one, the Vibrio that, that, that we, you know, we, these things are organized in 96 well plates. For those of you that know, there are 12 columns, uh, eight rows. One, uh, one A is the first one. So that was, that's the, this is one, one A. Uh, it happens to be a Vibrio. And, uh, and so you see the growth curves, uh, they, look, they look pretty nice, I think, for uh, different substrates which we, this will come later, uh, but here they're classified in terms of sugars, organic acids, or amino acids. You can also see in many cases this growth is zero. And so MATI basically fits their, uh, um, you know, uh, their growth function from which you can get yields, lags, and rates, but we are mainly looking at the rates. And, uh, <clears throat> and then we have this matrix of resource utilization. Okay, so what can we say from this matrix? Uh, so here's one thing that, uh, in case you care about the relationship between phenotype and genetic distance, there isn't a very strong signal here. It's, and there is no characteristic genetic distance at which things really change. It's, uh, we, of course, they become more, more phenotypically different as you go to long distances, but they slowly go down, and the, the phenotypic similarity of very closely related things is not that similar. Uh, that's what I can say about this. Um, and so the, the other thing that pretty obvious, perhaps, thing that you can do with this type of matrices is uh, 
the principal component analysis, uh, and, and this is what that looks like. And it turns out this is interpretable. So here, each of these dots is a strain, and so, uh, and when you project the, the, the types of resources, uh, sugars, organic acids, or amino acids on this PCA plot, you see that basically you have this coincidence, right? That uh, you have things that are pointing in the direction of sugars, in the direction of uh, uh, TCA cycle intermediates, and in the direction of amino acids. And so, uh, and this, this match is, is so good that uh, Mati uh, developed a, a simple index, really. It's just uh, based on the growth rates on sugars, Ks, and the growth rate on the acids, uh, Ka. You can have an index, you call it sugar acid preference, SAP. And so this, this uh, first principal component is almost perfectly correlated with that index. So we, we, I mean, in the rest of the talk, I'm just going to use the index, but it's the first principal component. So, so why would you have this type of specialization on acids and sugars? I'm talking about the first principal component. So I, I think uh, Terry may, may disagree with this, and I don't know what is the explanation, but I just I really want to mention, <clears throat> because it's very compelling, uh, uh, other people's work that I think is, 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 let's say, sounds relevant. So you have sugar metabolism <clears throat> that brings you, that you know, takes you down, well, down in the orientation of this graph, of course, towards, towards the TCA cycle. And then you have a gluconogenesis that uh, brings you up uh, into the TCA cycle. Okay, that part is, is fair. This is just textbook stuff. Uh, and so, <clears throat> so the, the, what I was referring to when I said work of other people is the idea that you may have a frustration if you want to do uh, both things at the same time. Um, so because glycolysis has a, uh, and gluconogenesis have opposite directions in their flux. And so, um, so if, like, as I was saying, like, glycolytic reactions will go down in this scheme, whereas gluconogenic reactions go up. And if you want to do both, you may have some type of futile cycle. So this has been looked at in a beautiful, I think, detailed way for E. coli and pseudomonas. What is not clear is whether this is a general explanation. But E. coli and pseudomonas have indeed these preferences for uh, glycolytic metabolism and gluconogenic metabolism, respectively. Like E. coli like does glycolysis preferentially, and pseudomonas does gluconogenesis preferentially. So, um, you know, this, this, I think they could potentially regulate and do this better, but it seems to be somewhat imprinted in their, in their, in their genomes, or whatever, in their genetic code somehow. So, so can, we, can we actually read that from the genomes? And again, without going into complicated metabolic models, which I, well, I mean, if I ever have to go into that, I'll, I'll do it, but I'm, I'm not super fond of it. Uh, See so if I can, my question, is there a simple way to make these predictions from the genomes? And as I will tell you, I, there is, and I think this is kind of interesting. So, so it turns out, and here's, here's a critical slide, so, so I, I make sure that uh, you're following what I'm saying here. What we are doing here is counting the number of genes that are bringing sugars into glycolysis. So, for example, galactose is a sugar, goes into glycolysis, and propionate, an acid goes into uh, acetyl-CoA or something like that, gets into the TCA cycle, <clears throat> or you know, goes upwards. Uh, so counting the number of genes that are in those reactions that are bringing sugars into glycolysis, or in those reactions that are bringing uh, acids into uh, gluconogenesis. Okay, just counting genes. So for example, it could be that uh, for galactose, you, you know, you, you have said in three, I'm not sure, in, I'll, I'll show you the, the, the exact pathway, but let's say in my scheme, there are three genes. There are more than three genes in reality. Um, it could be that you have many copies of the same gene, right? They don't need to be identical, but they have the same functional annotation. So you count that up, and you count all the other genes in the in this uh, feeder pathways into central metabolism. And when you do that, you see there is a really nice correlation in, the, in this particular case of propionate and galactose. When you have this, the sugar acid index on the horizontal axis, it's a very nice correlation that the, the more they prefer sugars, experimentally measured, uh, the more genes they have in the pathway that brings galactose into central metabolism. So they have more, more redundancy in a way, or the pathway is longer or something like that. And the opposite for propionate, for the, for the acid. Right? So, um, 
in the ca particular case of galactose, then we can look at that in more detail, right? So these are all the steps that bring galactose into glycolysis. Where you have, where, what is expanding in this particular case is the first step of the pathway. Well, that's where you have the correlation with, that's what's driving the correlation with the SAP, right? So it turns out that there are six and eight copies of those genes that are doing that, that step. So, so the, the, and when you look at what those copies are, so this is a phylogeny where we have made, we have made a phylogeny of all these genes in the, in the first step, I think it is, the beta to alpha D galactose, uh, second step. Uh, you see, <clears throat> these are the different clades in, uh, where you find the, the copies of the gene. The one, uh, the, the one where I have the arrows, the red arrows, this is, this is one organism, it's a flavobacterium that is a sugar specialist. And you see where the genes are, they are nested in many different clades far uh, distantly related to flavobacteria. In the alpha proteobacteria, in the, in the, in the gamma, et cetera, et cetera. Which means that this is horizontal gene transfer. These are not just copies of these genes. These genes are accrued from all over the, all over the place. And they just have more diversity of things that do approximately the same thing. Um, so, so the picture is something like this, right? So there has been an expansion of this part of this pathway. So, um, okay. So I'm going to go back to the previous slide uh, where I had the, the SAP and the galactose and propionate uh, slopes. Sorry, um, you know, uh, correlations. But I, I want to first tell you what I, in my opinion, on what these things are doing. Why do you have so many genes there? Uh, but this is just speculation, okay? So, and this is, uh, and I'm borrowing ideas from, from what people have observed in other cases. So, so my, my uh, uh, speculation about this is that these enzymes are, are not exactly redundant. They're just optimized for different conditions. So in the case of oxidoreductases in the electron transport chain, it has been shown, for example, that some work better at low oxygen concentrations and some work better at high oxygen concentrations, and therefore you have many copies of the, what seems to be the same thing, but it's really not the same thing. It's just optimized for different conditions. So if I'm, a, if I'm a, a, an expert, so like if you have different environments, you, you may use the different genes, that's the idea. So it's, I was gonna say, if I'm an expert in you know, repairing computers, I probably have a lot of tools to repair computers, right? Not just uh, one type, that kind, of, that kind of thing. Okay, this is speculation, but back to the data. The point here is that we can take these slopes and then uh, and, and get put, put a number into this, uh, in this ten tendency to lose or gain, gain genes uh, as a function of the sugar acid preference. And we can put these slopes there. And, and you know, this works pretty much, there's only one exception, and I'm not sure where it is, but it works for, uh, sorry, there are a few exceptions, but there are uh, majority of points. If you have a, a, a sh an acid pathway, the slope is negative. If you have a sugar pathway, the slope is positive. So galactose and propionate were not special cases. This is generally true for sugar and acid pathways. And so <clears throat> then we can basically aggregate them and then come up with a, a simple way to predict this sugar acid preference that doesn't need any complicated uh, metabolic model. It's just a linear, a linear, a linear uh, model with two variables. One is how many genes <clears throat> are how many, the gene counts of the sugar pathways and the gene counts of, sorry, of the, of the acid pathways. Oops, I wrote sugar and both, but they should be sugar and acid, sorry about that. All right, so this simple model, how, how good is it? So um, we have to train it on something, right? Uh, in our case, it's, I think it's reasonably good. We can predict the, the, the sugar acid preference from the genomes using the simple model. And we have a pretty good R square. And then what I think is more compelling is that <clears throat> Mati went to public data sets where it turns out that when people, it used to be the case, I don't know if they still do it, when they find a new species, they test whether they grow on lactose, on, on, uh, and, uh, on acetate, and a couple of simple things, and they report this data. So there are these tables with like 10,000 species and whether they grow on lactose and, and so on. And then of course we have the genomes. So we can, uh, we can make the predictions from the genomes using the simple model, and then we can see how well it works based on that data. And you know, there is a signal that is actually, depends on, on your standards, it's pretty good considering that this is data that we have not, uh, you know, we have not training at all in the, in the regression. So, <clears throat> so that's, I think, compelling uh, in the sense that there are these genomic signatures that are predictive of the, of the function of the system. 
So I think I'm kind of out of time, right? But uh, uh, how, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Uh, if, if, if there are no questions, I can, I will transition just to, to conclude. I will skip some things that I had, in, but I was thinking that I may need to skip, so I'm going to press this button. And so just to tell you, just to, to kind of wrap it around a little bit, <clears throat> what this means for the ecological dynamics. Um, so remember I told you that you can take these particles and sample them at different time points, and you get some picture of the ecological dynamics. So this is all news. It's the first paper I published in my lab. But <coughs> this is the, the figure from that paper. And so what you have um, on the, on the, if you haven't seen this, on the rows is um, different taxa, you know, and the red is the, uh, so it's normalized, the data is normalized per row, and it's a fractional abundance of that taxon at different time points. Red means the maximum fractional abundance, and black is when it's undetectable. And so you see a pattern of succession, where you have an early arriver that stays for a little while, and then other things arrive later, and, and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing is also that you, you, you have these phenotypes attached to it because we have the isolates, we can ask what they do. So if you look on the, on the this, this by the way, were particles made of chitin. So you ask whether they grow on chitin, or chitin is a sugar, it's a polysaccharide, whether they eat the, the monomers of chitin uh, or the dimers of chitin, and the answer is pretty much yes for the first part and no for the later arrivers. And so there you have this, this really drastic shift in a way in the phenotype. Uh, and turns out these are glycolytic organisms, primary degraders we call them, uh, or exploiters if they don't produce the enzyme to break down chitin. And the later part are the gluconogenic, predominantly gluconogenic organisms that we call scavengers because they're utilizing metabolic byproducts. So that for, for reasons that are, at that, well, they're still kind of somewhat unclear, but at that time we had no idea why would these metabolic byproducts be released if the only thing we have there is chitin. And there are different theories for this. But uh, uh, and, uh, this is kind of the, the wrong thing to do, I think, in terms of, uh, I know that you probably are very tired, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something very complicated. But if, if you want to close your eyes for the rest, uh, it's OK. I think you, 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 you did really well. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, um, so and maybe I just tell you the punchline, right? So the, what, uh, what mediates this transfer, we don't know. But I, I, from the data we have, we think is phages, phage predation prophages that uh, get uh, induced in the early colonizers release uh, metabolites uh, that the other things can, can, uh, can utilize. So maybe I, I just leave it there, and then if you want to see the data, I can show you. But uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and then take questions. And to, to the summary, it's just repeating things that I already said. There's a broad pattern of specialization, and uh, we can read it from genomes because this is let, it has a signature which could be just a correlate of these expansions in the, in the pathways, in the number of genes in the pathways. Uh, and, um, and then, well, the story, I didn't show you any data, but uh, is this, this idea that the, the transfer of different forms of carbon from the sugar specialist to the acid specialist, at least in the communities that we study, I think is largely driven by, by prophages being induced, which, you know, cells lice and all this, Metabolic byproducts are released for other organisms to, to take. Okay, so to, tons of people to, to acknowledge. Uh, I already did partly during the talk, as well as the funding sources, and this fantastic collaboration of people that includes Terry, that I'm uh, uh, proud to be a member of. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, we have uh, time for questions. Martin. Um, thank you, very nice. Um, one thing is, okay, let's say you see this um, change in, let's say, before you have uh, sugar specialists and then acid specialists, uh, and it's in a succession. But for example, when in a, in a single so resource like glucose, uh, you, you see both uh, sugar speciali specialists and acid specialists, yes. do you think that you need phages also in that case, or it's enough oh. cross-feeding? I, I don't know. I think, in, I don't know. In that case, it may be just enough. The, 
Well, certainly there is acetate coming out, right? But then yeah, but uh, there is also um, the problem in those experiments as well is that, as Terry mentioned, I think yesterday, you get into stationary phase, and then there is death. So I don't know, this could be phages, it could be natural death, but there is, I'm sure there's tons of things coming out in the, from, from, from stationary phase. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. So I am very fascinated by the last thing you were saying about prophage induction in the in the in the degraders. Do you have? I mean, I don't want to steal time. If this is going to take time, we can like discuss it in private. But do you have a sense of how prevalent these prophages are, like in these degraders? Like, if you take I don't know 100 of these degraders, how many of them will have prophages, yeah, yeah, and how yeah. many prophages in on average will they have? <coughs> Well, at least, so we looked at this in the communities. Okay, I, I also don't want to, to derail uh, too much uh, because the, the slides are a bit complicated. That's what's annoying. But what, so uh, we, we, we did, uh, we looked at the metagenomes of single particles colonized. And we can detect prophage induction by looking at the ratio of reads that recruit to the prophage versus the rest of the genome. This is not easy to explain. But, um, but uh, I think I, ah, sorry, I don't have it here, so. But um, in the communities that we assemble, so on these little particles, there are degraders and there are non-degraders, that you can tell from the genome. And then in those particles, the degraders were more likely, or sorry, they were more frequently with prophages than the non-degraders. So in those particles, at least statistically, then they are more likely to, to, to and then when you look at the things that get induced, it's pretty much only in on degraders. Because these are the first colonizers that are also growing fast. So when they're growing, there's something, we have no idea what the signals are, but that's when prophages got induced. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I'm interested in the, well, in all parts, but my question is about the second part where you have shown evidence of this extensive horizontal transfer of tools uh, in, uh, so, you know, I, I have long time ago, collaborators and me have this toolbox model of evolution, but in this toolbox model, we assume that if you have already have a tool, you don't need a second one. And you say that it's important to have multiple tools adapted to different yeah, conditions. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how much worse your fit would be if your presence or absence of tools would be binary. So if you have one tool, you already have one, you know, just at least one tool, zero or one. So is it really the tendency to accumulate variants which drives this correlation no. or just presence absence is enough? No, okay, I can tell you because I asked uh, Matty many times because I, I, I'm also showing this example because I, I think it's interpretable and I, I really like it. But I, he repeated to me many times uh, that th this was not the only way. There was also pathway length increasing, which I don't understand. That's why I'm not mentioning it. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know, uh, let's say 50-50 or something like that. It was not clear, maybe. but, but, uh, but this is definitely happens, and this I, I find it more interpretable. But also somehow pathway length gets, gets larger. I don't get it. First thing is about this, this multiplicity of the tool, very interesting. I think, let, let's pick an organism and study it. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, the, uh, and, and by the way, for the, the Galatos, you should only count the first two enzymes, because the, the other is used by everybody, because it's, it's right. to make a, a right. components of membrane. So, right. so that's right. where the signals, that's great. Right, right. Um, <laughs> about, the, about the phage part, again, what's the rationale that phage will give rise to Acid eaters, because they, 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 when it lies, you get amino acids. Amino yeah, acids, fine, but but you're not going to get uh, these acids. Where, where are you going to get these acids? No, but acids includes uh, amino acids. Huh? Acid eaters includes amino acids and organic. Yeah, yeah acids. but but then but then you know by your counts on the papyrine and this and because amino acid you just, you're taking generic transport, you're not going to find you're not going to find signature of amino acid because you directly go into amino acid. What do you mean? I don't understand. No. Like the way you were doing the propionate, uh, right, these pathway signals, uh, you're not going to, ah. how are you going to find signals of amino acid uh, eaters? Uh, that's a good question. So, that's a good question. But the, 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 the sign, yeah, because the, okay, that's a good question. Right. Because I mean, the, 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 if I'm not mistaken, this, 
this, when we, we, we count the number of genes for sugars, we count the number of genes for acids. Okay. These are not amino acid pathways. These are yeah, yeah, yeah. So, these so are you, I, I'm guessing that you're, you're actually recognizing acid either uh, yes. special, right? But and still so includes... I, I don't see a logical link. Right. I, I agree with you. But it still includes the amino acids, the ones that prefer amino acids. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I guess it's that because they're, they're primed to do gluconogenesis, and amino acids eaters are doing gluconogenesis. No, right, but, but yeah. <coughs> okay, any other question? <coughs> okay, let's thank, uh, thank Otto again. Thank you. So